Well, welcome, Ross. Thanks for joining us today. It's um, great to sort of catch up over the airwaves and um, chat a little bit about, I suppose, you know, your background, your experience with officiating. Oh, thanks, Michael. Thanks. And thanks for inviting me to take part. Yeah. So I suppose the first part of the plot is, I mean, where you're from, because not everyone will know sort of, you know, where you've, perhaps where you're born firstly, and then, you know, where you live now. And um, how did you sort of first get involved with triathlon, I suppose, firstly? Mm -hmm. um, so originally I'm from Christchurch, but uh, I've been living in Wellington for uh, 40 years this year, actually. Um, and uh, so I jokingly say that I'm now a Wellingtonian, except in the rugby season. Um, uh, so uh, the Crusaders are a pretty easy team to support, obviously, but um, I actually grew up right next door to Lancaster Park, which was then became Jade Stadium, um, is no more because it got flattened in the earthquake, unfortunately. But um, yeah, I sort of died in the wall, um, Canterbury supporter. I worked at the park, worked at the scoreboard and that, in the scoreboard and that sort of stuff. So yeah, being a, being a Canterbury supporter is a bit sort of ingrained. Yep. <laughs> Yeah, no, I can, I can relate being from Adelaide, like, you know, and follow the AFL with Adelaide Crows, so it's the same yeah. sort of thing, you know, even though I live in Melbourne, hey, I still follow the club from where I came from home, so yeah. it's quite, you know, certainly quite similar there. So how did you first sort of get, um, get involved in triathlon firstly? Just um, I think um, most people who are TOs get into it one of two ways. Either they raced or they, or they had family, that, that family or partners or something that raced. Uh, I raced. Uh, well, raced. I, um, I was a triathlete. I don't know whether, whether what I did was racing or not. Um, started back in 89 and um, I did th ended up doing three Ironmans in Auckland, um, 92, 93, 94. Um, then kind of retired for a bit. Um, came back and did Taupo in 2000. Um, Retired for a bit again and then ended up uh, racing short distance and went to World Champs in 2015. Okay. Um, but um, what do you enjoy? What, what got you know, motivated and you enjoyed about sort of staying with triathlon? Um, I can kind as, of as remember. An, as an athlete, yeah, this is, yeah. Yeah. I, I kind of remember watching some of the very early. Hawaii Ironman races with, you know, Dave Scott and Tinley and those guys. Mark um, Allen and yeah. Yeah, and watching the, watching them and thinking these guys are just absolutely cracked. Why would you Why would you do that? And and in particular, why would you do it in the heat of Hawaii? Um, but I think underneath that was like they might be cracked, but hey, that's really cool. <laughs> Um, and so, yeah, when it sort of started to become a little bit more sort of mainstream, um, I thought, oh yeah, I'll give this to go. Um, I needed to get fitter. Uh, mm -hmm. I had been, I had been playing cricket predominantly, but, um, anyway, I wanted to get a bit fitter and uh, I thought, oh, you know, I'll train up and do that. And, and basically just got hooked. Um, that was it from there really. Um, and back anyhow, back in the early nineties, um, I had done a little bit of officiating and then of course in Wellington we had the world championships in 94 and at that stage I was the Wellington club president and uh, so it got roped in to being one of the being on the LOC for that um, and then in 2003 the same guy that was that organized 1994 organized Queenstown so got roped in again to be on the LOC for that um, and from there um, sort of Terry Sheldrake um, who's on the now on the um, ITU board mm -hmm. um, just serving his final term at present um, but uh, he kind of shoulder tapped me to help out as a um, competition manager for the national series that was being set up. This was in about 2005, 2006. And um, so I ended up being the competition manager for our national championships for three or four years. I can't remember. Um, 
And out of that, he then wrote me into coming to a, an ITU level one TO course, and it all kind of went from there. Okay. So obviously, yeah, I mean, you sort of had a fairly big background there on the, almost the event management side of the sport um, to start with. How did that sort of help you as you sort of um, came into, I suppose, action as a, as a TO? Um, immensely, I would say, because, um, you know, it's, it's very easy as a TO to, to be looking at something and thinking, oh, that's no good, or why are they doing that? Mm -hmm. um, or, you know, that we need to change this or that or the other thing. Um, when you've been on the other side of the fence and you know why you're doing certain things, um, which, you know, to a, to a TO just coming in cold may not be apparent. Mm -hmm. um, but it's really important to understand it. And I think particularly as you get a little bit um, further up in the seniority and start taking on technical delegate roles where you're liaising with the LOC, actually having, a, having you know, some level of insight into the sort of challenges that, that they are facing um, trying, to, trying to put the event on in the first place is really, really useful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, just, just sort of stepping back there a bit for a minute. I mean, obviously, when you're an event manager, you had to deal with, you know, like a, 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 T, a TD at the time, an ITU TD or something yep. similar. Yep. How, how did you find that experience? Obviously, very early days of the sport and not sort of, you know, the amount of systems and policies we have today. But how was that sort of early time of dealing with, you know, a TD? Um, so the very first year... You don't have fact, to mention I, anyone's name. It's okay. <laughs> no, no, that's all right. So the, very, the very first year that I did it um, here in Wellington, um, and look, I'm quite prepared to, to, to own up. It was a complete horror story. Mm -hmm. um, the, if it could go wrong, it went wrong. Um, the day before the race had been one of those absolutely out-of-the-box, beautiful still Wellington days, race morning, I woke up at Blue Gale. Um, well, Wellington has that reputation, doesn't it? It, does. isn't it? it It's sort it of does. called the Windy City. Yeah, it is, for yeah. sure. Um, fun, funny story, after the, after the, just to give you an example, after, after the race, one of the, um, oh, at that stage, I think he was on the Try and Z board, guy came up to me and said, look, I've got a confession. Um, I didn't go around the last swim, boy. Uh, I couldn't keep up with it. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, yeah, and that, that was kind of this, just the sort of thing that was going on. But one of the things that they had done at that point was um, we were going along organising thing, things all nicely and then about, I think it was only about two weeks before the race, they said, oh, can we throw a Continental Cup, there, cup in there as well? Uh, yeah, Okay. And of course, we were completely under-resourced, um, so that was that was a big part of the problem. But um, I will mention a name because um, one of the pe people that was coordinating the technical side of Try and Z at that stage was Chanel Barrett, and of course, mm -hmm. Chanel was absolutely fantastic. I mean, yeah, she has a reasonably <laughs> reasonably good reputation in the sports. So. Yeah, so. In that in that respect, it was it was great because if there was a problem, um, you know, not only was Chanel onto it from the Try and Z side, but she's she has a you know really good appreciation of the ITU side. Every, you know, everything was it was just made life a whole lot easier. So you were sort of fortunate in a way to have someone who had sort of you know even like what your experience is now having sort of a, a foot in both camps, yeah. Um, who was involved in that side of things? So absolutely, yeah, yeah. And I mean, moving then into Queenstown, was it a similar sort of experience, or was there some other new challenges you faced there? Uh, well, Queenstown was a was a different gig altogether um, in that because it's so isolated, you've got to ship everything in there. Um, so I was the I was responsible for transition uh, when it was a split transition, and we had oh, <laughs> um, trying to get the two transitions to be a mirror image of each other and all the rest of it was um, mm -hmm. was kind of interesting. Yeah, I, I have sort of vague memories of that and the, just the water in the lake being really really cold or something at the time. 
Um, oh yeah, and it, <laughs> it was cold. Um, another interesting story for you is, you know, paratriathlon back then was uh, a completely different deal to what it is now. And of course the, um, the lake in Queenstown that we used was probably, I don't know, maybe 50 meters elevation, maybe not quite that much. Um, below the level of the area where the transition was and you've got people with out legs and all sorts of other things having to try and get up that hill so how so how did we do it golf carts oh geez okay <laughs> um yeah so it gives you i mean in those days the the paratriathlon was about whatever we have to do to facilitate these people having a race and you know in this case if that meant you know, golf carts because we've got to get them up a, a rough dirt track that's quite steep. Um, then that's what we do. So be it. So what were you? I mean, when, sort of moving now into more of I suppose your um, your background as a TO. Um, what was your sort of first experience as a TO? Yeah, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be as a TD, but perhaps at, you know, in an ITU level. Um, so the first one, probably, if I if I think about. Uh, 2009 um, Gold Coast. Okay. I had, I mean, I think I'd done, I'd maybe done the, the Lulabar World Cup prior to that. Um, but um, yeah, I was over, I came over to the Gold Coast 2009 and I was the, uh, I was the assistant run official. And again, things have changed dramatically. We didn't use, we didn't use mountain bikes or anything in those days. So you were just sort of stuck somewhere on the run course and in my case I was out there on the Pat Malone out, out at the Gold Coast, uh, the Surfers Paradise end of the run course for most of the day it seemed. Um, so that wasn't necessarily too inspiring um, as an experience necessarily but as we always say um, you know ev every role on the field of play is important um, and there wasn't much to do but it did mean that we were sure that none of the athletes had cut the course or done anything like that. So there you yeah. go. So I suppose then, I mean, yeah, obviously known a bit of your background and you, I mean, we, t we go right forward now to, to 2018 um, with the grand final and you're actually TD for the grand final. So it was probably quite a nice thing to come back in that role absolutely. at that event where you first started. Yeah, absolutely. It was um, something that I reflected on afterwards that, you know, Hey, it's been not quite 10 years, but um, there is, near as makes no difference um, to go from, um, you know, a part of the team to, to actually one of the people leading the team. And it was, um, yeah, so quite, quite satisfying in that respect. Because, I mean, it's, it's some of the people watching this will obviously be fairly new officials. They've been around sort of a year or two and thinking, oh, hey, I wouldn't mind going to one of these big events, um, being, you know, a, a Malula bar or, you know, a World Triathlon Series event. Um, you, how would you say, what would advice would you give them to sort of get the most out of their experience, given that it's their first time and, okay, in 2009, you might have had the greatest experience, but you still stayed with it. Today, how would they get the most out of, you know, being there at that event? So my experience at, and, I, and obviously I, by now I've been to a, a lot of events and a lot of different places, technical officials to a man and a woman are, prepared to share their experience, to help. So when you rock up to an event, if you're not experienced, you can bet your boots that, that either the chief official and some of the other assistants that you're working with in your area will be. Mm -hmm. Ask them questions. Get alongside them. Just, um, you know, go and have a beer with them afterwards, whatever it is. Um, they won't think I'm silly by sort of, you know, asking these sort of questions, which they know, you know, the depth of breadth not. of it all. Yeah. Ab absolutely not. I've never, I've never yet encountered any, anybody who, you know, with is, um, you know, going to turn people away or be so up themselves that they won't be prepared to go and have a drink with you afterwards or whatever, whatever it might be. Um, yeah, no, I think, you know, and I, I mean, I'm fortunate. I mean, one of the, one of the great things that, that the sport has done for me is, you know, I have a network of, of contacts with 
um, fellow officials, you know, all over the world. So, uh, and it's, it's very, very satisfying. Is that one of the rewarding things you have now? You've got that sort of network of friends, officials, and that you, oh, you know, completely. can connect with at any time? Yeah, completely, completely. I mean, you know, when you, these days, when I go to an event overseas somewhere, as much as anything, it's a, it's a reunion with, you know, with a number of people that I already know and a number of people that I hopefully will get to know. Okay. So when you, I mean, take a step back, obviously in, you know, in 2009, you traveled over to the, the Gold Coast and perhaps you'd been in Malulabar before that. Um, when you were first starting to travel, what was there any particular thing you were nervous about or felt uncomfortable about being sort of, you know, at an event? Um, no, I don't think so because, um, I mean, I guess one of the things right from 2008 is we got to meet the key ITU folks who are, uh, who are traveling around. So from then on, um, when, when you rock up, one of them's there to start with. So, you know, there's always going to be someone, someone, you know, um, I guess one of the things also in um, New Zealand um, officials have always been, um, I guess, quite enthusiastic travellers. Um, so it's been quite unusual over the years for me to rock up at an event and for me to be the only New Zealand official that's there as well. Um, but look, what I would say to, to anybody watching is, um, you know, take advantage of the of the opportunities to travel, um, not just within your own country but overseas. Um, that, um, I'm I'm fortunate that I've had you know been financially able to go and do that, um, but I think that's that's certainly been a part of um, the fact that I was I gained sufficient experience to you know, to ultimately make it through to be the, the TD at a world champs, for example. Yeah. How did, I mean, yeah, in those early days, how did the sort of the traveling add to your experience as a TO, do you think? Um, I guess when you are traveling internationally and particularly if it's to world championships or something, you know, those sorts of events where you're there for several days, you know, you are immersed in that event for a period of time um, you've got some of the best officials in the world who are there and you've got the opportunity to learn from those best people so i mean it sounds like you've had a lot of you know obviously a lot of experience over the years ross and there's been i'm sure there's been some challenges along the way and can you sort of relay an experience of where, you know, you were quite challenged? It could be as a TD, as a TO, um, where, you know, an experience where I suppose you had the opportunity to learn from? So a couple of those. Um, 2012 in Auckland. So I was an assistant TD for that event and I had responsibility for the swimming courses. Um, the weather conditions over there were re uh, in Auckland for that event were really challenging in terms of trying to get the, the swim course set up. And we were looking at all sorts of different scenarios of shortening the course. Um, so that was certainly a learning experience in terms of um, contingency plans and trying to come up with alternatives um, as to how we could um, best configure the, the swim course. As it turned out, we managed to, we managed to get them all done. Um, I guess the other one was, uh, I, was I was actually um, just an assistant official because I was racing in uh, Chicago in two, uh, 2015. I was just an assistant transition official. And uh, that was an event where, pretty, where a lot of stuff happened. They had thunderstorms and had to evacuate the site and all sorts of things. Um, the last of which was that the bridge connecting the swim start pontoon to the land collapsed um, to the extent they were actually able to man manage, 
they were able to get the athletes onto it so they could start the race, but there was no way of getting them out of the water and back onto the land. So we had to, had to revert to a second transition area that was you know, 750 metres further along that, had, that we had pretty much just finished packing up because we used it for the paras. Um, and then in the space of about 30 minutes, rebuild it. <laughs> So that was kind of interesting. No, it's not something you normally expect. And I suppose it's <laughs> yeah. it's part of, you know, well, where we often learn the most is when we get thrown these things we, we never expected. Absolutely. And I mean it's it's one of those things you learn as a TO that, you know, you know, anything that can go wrong can go wrong, can go wrong. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Doesn't necessarily mean it will, but it can. Yeah, and I, I think it's really good learning for those people who are sort of newer to the program or coming through the program in that you won't know it all. And it's only through the, you know, it's through circumstances like that that you do learn. Absolutely, yeah. Um, as far as, I mean, you've obviously been to a whole lot of events over the years. Is there sort of like, you know, events you, you, know, you really enjoy being part of or you sort of gravitate towards? Um, <clears throat> I've been... Very fortunate to go to two of the so far three um, world multi-sport festivals. Uh, the first one in Penticton um, and then last year in Pontevedra. And without hesitation, I would say if, um, to any technical official, if you ever get the chance to go, and obviously in our part, part of the world, um, assuming our current challenges are um, overcome, then Townsville next year, you, you certainly have the opportunity to go to the World Multisport Festival. It's got the sort of the, the buzz and the hype of a world championship without quite necessarily, you know, you, you don't typically have the same um, sort of rock star factor um, in terms of the athletes, although in Pontevedra we did obviously because we had uh, Javier Gomez, Gomez Pontevedra, his his hometown, and so half the town turned out to see to see Javier. But um, <clears throat> the the thing about those events is they're a week long, um, and you really get to start to build some relationships with with the with the uh, with the other officials, mm -hmm. the the athletes themselves again, because a lot of them are there for a for a, a reasonably extended period and take part in more than one one of the events. Um, it's it's kind of a different atmosphere um, about it all, uh, and yeah. So and and I mean the cross tri the the um, the cross triathlon folks are are another breed as well. They're, they're some of them are pretty loose. Um, you've got to adapt your officiating style accordingly uh, because, you know, they're not quite used to, um, you know, blue carpets and mountain, light, mountain dismount lines and all that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, without without question, I would say if you though that they are my my favourite events to go to. And, and they've obviously been a fairly new occurrence over the last few years, these multi-sport festivals where we had used to have the separate, you know, duathlon and cross. And um, we've had a couple of those, obviously, in, the, in long distance, we've had those in this region. I suppose, um, you know, when that all comes together, what, what can an official expect as far as, you know, I'm a new official, I go up to Townsville. What sort of experience can I expect to have there? So you, it'll be organised into, typically into three blocks. Um, so the first block is the um, is usually the duathlons. Then the second block will be the cross and the aquathlon, and the third block is the long distance. Okay. Um, so as an official, I don't need to commit for the whole period of time, the ten days, whatever it goes for. I can just sort of come up for one of these blocks. If yep, that's 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 always an option. Um, and of course, obviously, you're assigned. A role for that block it may not be the same role that you have in the other blocks right um, and yeah so you you get you get to do a, a bunch of different things um, 
And I, I, as I say, that just that, that long, that prolonged period um, or extended period, if you are there for the whole time of the event, um, it's to me the the longer I the longer I'm involved in as an official, the more I I think the whole game's about relationships. And okay. you know, rather than you know a lot of a lot of events, you rock up, you don't necessarily know anyone or many people. You're there for a day or two days at the most, and you're off. Whereas whereas this in, in this situation, you're there for a, a sort of slightly longer period. And look, it's not all work. Um, the way the system tends to work is that you have a day of racing, and then a day of race briefings, another day of racing, another you know. So there's there's there are days off in between, essentially, where you're not um, flat out officiating every day. So there is time to have a look around and um, socialise a little bit with your colleagues, and and I think oftentimes that's where you learn the most is not necessarily on the field of play. It's actually the things you're doing alongside being on the field of play. Yeah. And obviously you've traveled to you know, lots of different locations around the world and experienced that sort of that downtime. Is there a particular sort of experience that sort of, you know, in that downtime that's sort of a highlight for you, you know, great experiences you've had? Well, I'll go to the, oh, I'll go to the top. So I went to Rio in 2016 and, um, you know, so there's a, there's a, a, a different experience again, but, um, you know, actually going around and seeing some of the sites of Rio in between our race commitments, um, plus plus getting to go to some of the other Olympic events um, in between our own commitments. So, yeah, it's that was uh, that was pretty special. Pretty cool, yeah. And as far as I mean, yeah, often, yeah, the I mean we often unfortunately do travel to some of these races and we just do the race and come home, which is sort of a bit of a set, bit sad in a way that we don't get to sort of, to sort of see some of the, um, the countryside. So it was great. And certainly in that circumstances, you know, yep. that you're able to do that. Well, I guess the other one, um, and actually Michael, you'll, you'll recall this because you were there. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> uh, was the first year I went that we, yeah. Both went to Yokohama, um, and if you recall, I think we oh, shared a room. I think I, I, think I know the one you guys, yeah. 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 And um, on the Sunday after the race, there were a, a few of us decided, oh, well, we're going to truck on into Tokyo and, and have a look around. Um, and we emerged from a subway station into the middle of this enormous Shinto Festival of religious sort. festival, yeah, yeah, <laughs> and I mean you've never seen, you, you know, you've probably never seen as many people except at a football game, <laughs> yeah, wandering around the streets. It was um, it was quite surreal in a way. I think it was like so, a million people in that area. Oh, it was, it was just, <laughs> yeah, just it was incredible. I, th- I think our only advantage was certainly that we're a little bit taller, could see, you know, <laughs> see over things, but uh, it wasn't it wasn't what I was expecting. Yeah, so we're trying to trying to find something to eat and um, headed into the headed into a restaurant. If you oh, yeah, right. we, had, we had no idea what was on the menu, but um, somebody said, "Oh, just bring food." <laughs> yeah, that's right. Four, and we get yeah. four cokes. We knew they knew yeah. what coke was. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that sort of translated yeah. into Japanese. So yeah, no, yeah. that was that was certainly a, certainly a yeah. unique time. I mean, going back, I suppose, into the sport of triathlon, is there is there moments which have you know you found very inspirational uh, and being part of? Everybody talks everybody talks about the para triathlon, and yes, you know that is without question seeing um, some of the things that these folks do to get themselves around the race course you can't help but be inspired um personally and i'm going to come back to sort of 2018 gold coast it was um sort of standing at the at the finish line on the sunday afternoon um, and then getting together with the team um, after that and reflecting on what had been a pretty neat few days um and and pretty successful few days um that um that was yeah one of the highlights i guess for for myself 
How did you, I mean, how did you feel having, you know, sort of delivered that event? It's hard to sort of just, hard to even imagine, you know, for a grand final, so many events, so many days, elite under 23s. I mean, it must, yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, apart from being probably exhausted, um, how do, you know, how did you sort of um, feel within yourself at that moment? It's a good question. I mean, I think satisfied has to, was probably sums it up. Um, I was, um, initially I was one of the assistant TDs for that race. And um, in, was just after, or just, I can't remember, it was just before the Commonwealth Games earlier that year at the same venue. Um, the original, one of the original TDs had to, had to pull out from being the, um, from the grand final. And so I was asked to, to take it on. And it, you think, you know, initially you think, uh, you know, be careful what you wish for maybe. <laughs> um, so I think, you know, being able to reflect back that, hey, actually, yeah, we obviously, um, and, and not just me, the whole, it's, it is um, a, a TD team of, of five people these days for those events. And, um, you know, the whole team just did an outstanding job. And, you know, it was, we were, we were lucky. We had a, um, we had a great LOC that understand ITU events as well. Mm-hmm. So, um, but yeah, just, just sitting back and saying, well, that was, that was pretty bloody good. Yeah. And obviously a lot of people watching this won't necessarily ever, you know, may not ever be in that, that particular role, but they'll certainly have the opportunity to be a, a TD at a local event or thing, or, you know, perhaps an ITU event. What would you say, what would be the sort of the three keys that, you know, would go across any event where you're in that sort of, that sort of senior role, the three keys to actually doing it well? So the first one is, uh, is planning or planning and preparation, if you like. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, understanding the event properly um, and making sure that all the plans are done um, and, and in place so that you're ready to deliver the event. The next one is the relationship that you build with the LOC. Um, we are, when, when it comes down to it, um, you know, yes, we might be a, a technical team on the one hand and an LOC team on the other hand, but you've got to be one team. Mm-hmm. Uh, you have to work seamlessly together. Otherwise it's, it, it will descend into chaos. And I've seen, I've seen that happen. Um, so yeah. Um, and then I think it's, um, delegating and trusting the officials that you've, that you've got on your team to do the job that they, that they've been asked to do. Um, now sure in order, in order to trust them, you've got to work with them and make sure they understand what's required. But, um, yeah, at the end of the day, it's 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 again, it's that relationship with your with your team, um, and them understanding what's required in order to deliver the event. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I suppose going back and you know, certainly in what you're saying there, that last point in terms of trust, you when you're starting out were probably put in positions of trust, like, here, Ross, I want you to do this job. I trust you. You know, you'll do the right thing. I mean, it's important to sort of, I think, build that certainly, you know, with officials and to, you know, when you're given that opportunity, it, it, how did it feel to you? Yeah. Um, scary at times, to be honest. Yeah. Um, and look, the, but, the you weren't, line, but you weren't alone, were you? Absolutely not. And look, the bottom line is that there are going to be times when, you know, someone trusts you to do a job and you'll do your best, um, but you won't get it right. No, really? <laughs> yeah, we don't, we, yeah. It's like we we don't get it right every time. That's yeah, that's yeah, yeah just so crazy. But certainly, um, I mean, there was probably you, obviously the guidance there and the, or the mentorship, whatever you want to yeah. call it, just sort of help you through. Yeah. So the the key is though, when when you don't get it right, mm. is to learn from that. Yeah. Um, you know, there's, you know, as you say, we're not none of us. None of us are perfect. We're all going to make mistakes. Um, and as long as you've you've 
you know, done, it's, if you've been doing your best and, you know, working honestly, I guess I'd say, um, then no one, you know, hell, we're volunteers after all here. Um, you know, no one, no one can get too upset with you. Um, if, if, however, you're making the same mistake time after time after time, then maybe there's a few questions to be answered. But um, No, I see what you're saying. Yeah. So I suppose looking forward, we're in a bit of a strange time at the moment, obviously in the, in the world of COVID-19 and um, things have sort of stopped in the triathlon world. But if we sort of look forward, you know, a year or two, what are you sort of most looking forward to over the, you know, the next couple of years as far as your own sort of um, officiating in triathlon? Um, well, I was um, a little bit taken aback uh, sort of this time last year when I got an email from ITU saying, congratulations, we'd like you to be the be one of the head referees for the Paralympics. Mm. Um, so clearly that's on hold for, uh, for this year. Hope, and again, a bit like Townsville, hopefully um, we've yeah. got... All Fingers of this crossed, yeah. Mess behind us um, in time for it all to go ahead next year. So that's that's the one that's um, sort of biggest or, or um, foremost on in my mind at the moment. I was uh, well, I was set to be uh, going to El Mare for the multi sport festival this year. Um, at this stage, that's still on the calendar, um, but I would be extremely surprised if it goes ahead i'd have to say um and and if it does go ahead i'm not entirely sure whether i would still go um or could go i suppose yeah or either could go or i mean the, the there's potential issues with you know having to quarantine and what have you on the way back and just sort of kind of starts to 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 push it into the too hard basket um as it will i think for most you know, if for no other reason than it would be also very hard for the participants, um, you know, I is one of the reasons I'd be surprised if it goes. But there you go. Just go, just uh, just sort of in the last sort of, uh, I suppose, coming to the end of the conversation now. But certainly in terms of preparing to be, you know, um, a head referee, what are you what are you going to do to sort of be best prepared for that particular event? Okay, so. Um, Paratriathlon is uh, has got its own challenges, of course. Uh, so I made sure that one of the events that I went to this year, uh, the, pretty much the last event that got to, one of the last events that got to go was the Devonport World Par World Paratriathlon Series race. So um, I uh, I put my name down for that, and then uh, spoke nicely to the technical delegate and said please can I be one of the referees so I can practice. Um, likewise, I was, I was due to be going to Yokohama, um, which has both a World Tri-Series and a World Para-Series race. Uh, obviously, that got cancelled. But So that's one thing you do. It's obviously is practice the role. Is yeah. there anything you, you can do sort of mentally or emotionally or physically or whatever to be sort of, you know, at your best for that particular role? Say you couldn't um, actually go and practice, what would you do? Well, certainly you've got to. Uh, I would. I would be studying the rules as I do anyway, um, ahead of a um, a race of that nature. Um, and I guess um, just sitting back and working through scenarios in in my head. Um, all right, what if this happens? What What am I going to do? How am I going to go? How am I going to approach it? Um, you know what? What are the what are the steps in the process that I'm going to need to follow if, um, you know, we get a I don't know a disqual we get a disqualification for uh, not serving a penalty, for example. Um, all right. So how am I how am I going to go about um, addressing that one? Yeah. So yeah, I mean, scenarios is always you know an, an excellent sort of learning tool and 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 sort of being sort of certainly prepared there um, yeah. for that. I mean, we could talk all day, Ross. We obviously know each other well. With, you know, yeah. as I said, we had the, those good times in Yokohama. And we won't go into the, the karaoke singing, <laughs> but it was yeah, it was, it was a real pleasure to speak to you today. And yeah. um, 
I'd certainly love to revisit some of these conversations a little bit later and, and um, explore them more. Um, but thanks, thanks so much again for uh, joining us today. Oh, you're welcome, Michael. And um, yeah, all the best with the rest of the, the interviews you're going to be doing.